Good evening, everyone. It's 8 p.m. UK time, so it's definitely time to start our live event. I'm happy to be back here. So welcome to our uh, IVF webinar tonight. And of course, as you see, we have another special guest uh, today. We have Mandy Rodriguez with us. Hi, Mandy. Hope you are feeling fine. How are you? I'm good, Caroline. Thank you for having me again. Exactly. We are very happy to have you back with us. Of course, this is your second webinar here, and I am very, very excited for you to come back here and present another a very uh, important and def definitely difficult topic as well. And uh, please let us know that you can hear us loud and clear. My name is Caroline, and I'm your host today, as always. And of course, uh, let me just tell you a few things. So Stronger Together initiative has been brought to you uh, as we want to help you out uh, throughout your IVF journey. And we, as you know, have invited lots of top fertility expert to support you. And also, I just want to mention that, uh, as you probably so we were able to get a very important award to, uh, for us. It's, uh, we are very proud of it. We have received medical, from Medical Travel Award uh, for Best Marketing Initiative. So thank you for that, because as you already know, it would be very hard to get it without the help of our top experts, but also without the help of our ambassadors and partners. And uh, I definitely want to mention that Mandy is one of our ambassadors. So uh, thank you, Mandy, for supporting our <laughs> initiative <laughs> once again, yes. because this is our second uh, edition and we are definitely proud because uh, this is very um, uh, this is the very important to us but I know many many patients have been able to um, simply find it very useful and informative as well and of course all the rest of the ambassadors and partners you can see right here and today uh, Mandy has brought another important topic which is the stress cause my fate ivf and how to manage stress to ensure a successful ivf and uh, as always mandy will start with her presentation on this topic i will give you some tips i have no doubt here and after that remember it will be time for your questions so all you need to do is just type those questions in the chat section and mandy will be happy to help you with those questions no doubt here as well and um that will be it from me at this point so mandy thank you are Caroline. you ready to start yes i'm ready happy to hear that go ahead please. thank you thank you good evening everyone across the world um i want to just tell you a little bit about myself i went into this field because i battled with ivf myself i had two miscarriages and I went through three IVFs and I'll never forget going through that first IVF was the worst because I kind of thought I had done everything right and I'd eaten right and I'd managed everything and if the the most kind of invasive fertility procedure didn't work for me why would I do it again because what hope did I have to do it again and that was my journey about 25 years ago and I'm happy to say I then managed as we always hear these stories after my IVFs while I was trying to save up for another one I fell pregnant so I did then have my children and um, this is where my passion about stress and IVF started so I just want to look at why this is so important and I think the important for all of us is to decrease time to pregnancy and because IVF is so much out of our control and infertility is so much out of our control I found it important to look for a way to empower patients to actually have a little bit of control in the process and to eradicate that that intense guilt that they felt if it didn't fail I looked at research around the world that even in countries where um, the government or medical aid paid for five free IVFs, patients were reluctant to go back for a second IVF because of that huge emotional kind of disappointment and lack of control and guilt. And so it wasn't just the financial burden. And I like to say that all fertility specialists 
tend to practice the same science. We all attend the same conferences. We all get the same research. We use the same culture mediums. But what is important is those softer skills on that stress management. So if I have a look at some of the research in the past, um, actually, kind of a, a year ago, did a pilot study on looking at salivary amylase as a measure of stress. So it was a, it, um, it's a swab of saliva and they correlated it to how stressed the patient was. They didn't take that um, much further, but they knew that if they could decrease that uh, salivary amylase, that level, they could decrease time to pregnancy. Other studies um, were highlighting the role of emotional support, saying that clinics should be encouraged to develop non-medical support for couples, Depression and anxiety level in IVF and ICSI patients with endometriosis was important. Um, looking beyond emotional factors, so addressing things like stress, which I'm going to get into now, and that a positive relationship existed between pregnancy outcome and the relationship between spouses. Further studies, um, if we look at stress in the acute setting, so a lot of people say to me, but how am I not supposed to be stressed going through an IVF? It's invasive and it's acutely stressful and there's an impact on my life and my job. And when I was in Geneva last year or um, issue was, I can't remember where it was last year, but some of the, the papers that were presented was stress and the impact on assisted reproductive technology outcomes, saying acute stress had no outcome on the number of eggs, number of um, gametes produced, and pregnancy outcome. So what they were basically saying is stress at aspiration and depression at aspiration was kind of acute stress and it was normal. And that wasn't what had an uh, impact on the, the, the outcome of that result. So they were, they were kind of saying that although aspiration might be painful and stressful, that increase in stress did not appear to impact on the outcome but there was research starting to emerge that um, job related stress in those patients there was higher pre pregnancy loss which made us look further into stress and we started looking at the role of chronic stress so when I attended SASOG, which in South Africa is the gynecological conference they had a look at those who were less chronically stressed reported lower miscarriage rates and higher full-term pregnancies. And when we put all that research together, they said we are missing something also in carrying your pregnancy to term. Now, back in 1996, which was when I, was, I started battling with my IVF, I got involved with um, a doctoral study and we started looking at doing a laparoscopies on patients who were stressed. And we looked at a whole realm of, of stress um, tools, including depression and anxiety. And we used a sample study of women who had undergone one IVF and were planning for their next IVF. And we measured, um, we did a laparoscopy and we measured how many of them had endometriosis and then we measured all their stress levels. And we found a definite re relationship between endometriosis and um, a certain personality type, which we call the time urgent perfectionist personality. Um, we then put these women through a stress management course for 10 weeks, and there was a huge improvement in not only their stress, but um, prior to, so in their first IVF, there was, let's say, in 1996, a third of them would fall pregnant. Following stress management, over two thirds of them fell pregnant in their subsequent IVF. And that was back in 1996. So we then started having a look at what was it, and it was done originally on 54 patients. Um, the average pregnancy rate in the initial sample group was about 83% in the second study. But over time, and we've done about 4,000 patients, it's now around about a pregnancy rate of 67% plus in a second IVF. And we had a look at a specific personality type that was responsible in terms of not um, a direct relationship to infertility, but an indirect relationship. And we looked at two factors. So we had a look at 
time urgency. So patients who were stressed about time, but not only in relation to the IVF, time in relation to work, time in relation to going to the shops and there's not enough people to help you and you end up running late. And we saw that with these patients with this particular stress profile, they were also perfectionists. And I'm not talking about perfectionism in terms of neatness, organization, attention to detail, but I'm talking about the way they thought. They had a higher, um, higher expectations of themselves and others. They didn't like being out of control. And when we looked at these patients, they also had a poor post test and they tended to have a higher rate of autoimmune disease like thyroid illness. And more recently, we've seen the patients present with type two diabetes. And you can see there, if we look at the blue bars over here, was the pregnancy rate with their first IVF um, and how high their stress levels were. And then the pregnancy rate as their stress levels decreased, and I think this graph might be back to front, the pregnancy rate actually shot up. So we're looking basically at the field of psychoneuroimmunology. And that's just a fancy word to say that the way you think has a big impact on your physical, um, your physical self. So we'll often hear of maybe an old um, person dying and six months later their partner dies. Um, there's a big relationship between the mind and the body. And when we looked at that, we saw that there's two types of stress we all exposed to. There's something called good stress and there's something called bad stress. Now, good stress is the stuff that is not going to cause an impact on our IVF. So good stress is kind of the stuff that a relaxed person would worry about. So if we look at COVID, which was very interesting, that's a very real stress and it's happened around the world and a lot of people have been stressed by it. But if I looked at my patients during COVID, because I worked throughout COVID, um, IVF clinics were closed um, during South Africa's initial lockdown. But during our softer lockdown, they weren't coming in for IVF, but the pregnancy rate actually shot up pretty dramatically. It's almost like people during war, people during um, situations where they're secreting adrenaline, the um, pregnancy rate would go up. I mean, people fall pregnant during war, during poverty, et cetera. But when we look at the right side at the learned stress, which is what we call the bad stress, this was the self-induced stress we were worried about. Remember, your body can secrete adrenaline in a fight flight response. It's acute. It, it kind of reacts and it gets you out of that situation. But when we secrete secreting adrenaline long term, the body changes that to noradrenaline and cortisol. And this has an impact on our immune system. And as I go through this with you, you'll see that 90% of the stuff you stress about, and I know you, you don't believe that yet, 90% of the stuff we stress about is actually self-induced. And that is the stuff that we are worried about in terms of infertility. So it may feel impossible, like I say here, to change habit, all right? Um, if you look at the picture on the right, the three biggest fears of our generation. As we've been looking over the last 20 years, infertility rates have increased dramatically throughout the world. And what is it corresponded with? It's corresponded with internet, access to business 24-7, it's access to communication 24-7, access to books. Um, and this specific personality type, which we call the time urgent perfectionist, is more prone to feeling stressed about issues other than IVF. So we designed a course, which we also designed online, which said, when is it healthy to stress? And that was in 10% of the time. It's healthy to be stressed during an IVF. That's normal, absolutely normal. But it is not in the 90% of the time healthy to worry about the fact that my friends are falling pregnant and I'm now 35 and this is not happening because worrying about that stuff is not going to help the IVF. Worrying about the fact that I've got to go for an aspiration and I have to go and I have to take my meds every day and I have to go for a COVID test, of course, that 
drives us to actually go and do that stuff and go and have the COVID test and take the medication. But beyond that, the stress has no impact on the outcome in a positive way. So let's look a bit more at good stress. Like I said, it, reduce, it, it releases adrenaline. It's usually acute. With real stress or good stress, we acutely get stressed and then we get off it. And again, it's 10% of our lives. So there's a flood or there's COVID or there's an aspiration. We get stressed acutely and then we get off it. When we look at bad stress, and I'll put an ex a picture here of, of traffic, it becomes self-induced. We worried about getting somewhere on time. We worried about the stupid drivers on the road. We worried about the fact that the it, the government hasn't fixed the roads, that there's no pointsman on duty, but it doesn't help us get from A to B any quicker, all right? It has no impact on the result. And we realize that 90% of the stuff you worry about in terms of self-induced was the problem. We also then started dividing stress into what is predictable and what is unpredictable. Now, the bottom line is 90% of the stuff we go through is predictable. We know when we're going through IVF, the more predictable we make that process, the better we're going to cope. So the more we plan for what we're going to go through and when are our bad days and while we're waiting for the lab results, that is predictable. And in theory, if we can predict something, we can plan for it and we can manage it better. Um, in theory as well, if we can predict something, we can avoid ourselves from going into this relentless stress cycle that we tend to currently kind of roll into, which I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you in a second. Unpredictable stress is the things or the triggers that happen that we have no control over whatsoever. So in theory, you're allowed to be a bit more stressed about something that is unexpected, such as a negative result. Um, but each time we're faced with something that is unpredictable, we've got to try and move it into, could I have predicted this? So, for example, with something like an accident, could I have put on my GPS and predicted on my satellite, on my car, that I could have taken another route and moved it to the predictable side and possibly avoided that entire cycle? So, let's look at IVF as a trigger. First of all, if I look at whether it's real or self-induced, I've said to you before, it is definitely real. Even relaxed people in your life would get stressed about IVF. The cost, the aspiration, the tablets, time of work, maybe not so much the time of work, I'll get to that now, but that's definitely real stress. If we look at the bad stress or the self-induced stress associated with IVF, and I think I'm on the wrong slide there. Okay, so there's the real stress. The self-induced is suddenly worrying about taking time off work. That a relaxed person, if, if, if you know someone relaxed or you think your spouse is relaxed or you, a sibling is relaxed, just ask yourself, would they stress about the fact that I've got to take time off work to go and have my aspiration? or to have my transfer. And no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't stress about that. And then the perfectionism side, did I eat right? What if I'm an older mom? What if I'm an older parent? Would a relaxed person worry about that? No. Worrying about these two factors over here, taking time off work and did I eat right? Am I gonna be an older mom? Am I gonna fit in? Am I gonna have a baby when I wanted to? It doesn't help the outcome of that result. Worrying about this factor over here and do I have money for the process and do I need to go for a COVID test drives our worry into an acceptable pathway which is not going to impact on your IVF. Like I said before, predictable or unpredictable, we look at IVF, it is definitely predictable. So we can familiarize ourselves with the process going through the second one. And when we look at research across IVF. So there's a great study that looks at IVF number one, and hopefully we don't need to get to number two, three, four, and five, but they looked across five IVF processes. People struggled the most with IVF number one. 
because they were not familiar with the process, because they thought process was, I am engaging in something that is the gold standard of ART, and if that doesn't work, what then? They were often thinking, I need to plan for a negative result, but not thinking before. What happens if it's an abandoned cycle? What happens if, by chance, my embryos don't grow in the laboratory? What if I'm having PGS and or pregenetic screening or testing, and in fact, it's, there's no embryos to test or to place back? So the first IVF was very daunting because it was unpredictable on this side. When they went through the second and third, they tended to cope far better with number two and number three because they were familiar with the medication, they were familiar with the roller coaster effect and what it did to the relationship. The unpredictable side, of course, going through the second IVF or the next one was always, what is the result going to be? And how many eggs, embryos, gametes am I going to get? So ultimately, we talk about something called hook time. So hook time is the amount of time you remain stressed about a particular event. So imagine you have a conflict, and um, my husband's very good at it. In a conflict, he would maybe get stressed in the five minutes he has the conflict, but then he gets off it and carries on with his day. So his amount of stress or hook time is five minutes for that particular trigger. The way I used to be is worry about what did I say? What are the people going to think? How am I going to face that person at work tomorrow? And so my amount of no adrenaline I was secreting was in excess of 24 hours. And of course, so that's why in, I ended up with infertility because the amount of time I remained stressed about something was in excess. And I need to share with you that I... I did control my stress and managed to have my um, my children. And of course, then my stress went out the window and I would worry about getting to work on time and doing everything right. And five years ago, I got a breast cancer and had to go through chemo and, and all of that because I had lost my perspective in terms of this. My stress was going to work and feeling tense all the way to work and taking everything personally. And again, just like cancer, just like infertility, like autoimmune disease, if we're worrying for an in excess, an excessive amount of time, we're secreting more noradrenaline and cortisol, which is going to have an impact on our IVF. So we developed something that I'm going to allow you all to do a, a, a test on and tell you about an exciting study we're doing. We, the kind of couples we were seeing and the kind of corporates we see do not want to sit in long-term therapy and say what is going on in my life and how do I fix this and why is this not working they wanted something that was practical something that they could implement and something that would have a kind of a, I guess a quicker outcome and a, a, a quicker um, a more kind of an algorithm to manage their stress going forward. So if we look at the way we manage stress, people say to me, I've tried to manage my stress. I've tried to go for assertiveness courses. I've tried to go for stress management, but they've gone for maybe pretty complicated stress management courses. They've maybe not known when to apply the skills. And so this is what we started looking at is we divided stress into triggers. So a trigger being anything that creates a negative reaction. And that includes something like a negative IVF, but it includes the simpler things like a conflict, traffic, an email, um, a deadline. And what happened is this pushed us into a stress cycle. And we took every field of psychology and put it into an algorithm. And we said there are four reactions to stress. There's a physical reaction, there's something you say to yourself, a way you think about it, and then there's a certain way you behave. And this is kind of like a, a snowball effect. And it turns and turns and turns, and the snowball just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And we, we not even aware. So we enter this IVF with this huge, almost baggage on our shoulders of this huge snowball, and it's going to give somewhere. And it might give in terms of a, a physical illness. It might give in terms of our thinking where we just completely burn out or we suddenly start getting aggressive or depressed. So our whole aim was saying, okay, how do we either, like I said, make our triggers predictable? If we can make our triggers predictable over here, we can then avoid those triggers. If we cannot make them predictable, we then thrown into that cycle, but we would teach you four different mechanisms of how to get out of that cycle. Four different schools of therapy that say, okay, when I'm in this particular yellow block of the puzzle, this is what I implement. And oh dear, that one didn't work. So when I'm in the next block, this is what I'm gonna implement. So that we could have people into their next IVF cycle with 90% of their stress reduced. So with that snowball having dissolved and maybe all they're dealing with at the end is going through their IVF, but they've got the tools to manage it. So very important, I know a lot of patients that I see, if the doctor or fertility specialist says, you know, were you stressed? Is that maybe why it didn't work? Straight away, they're saying to us, well, are you blaming me? And is this why it didn't work? And we're not blaming people at all. We're saying, if you have this personality type or if you're stressed, you have the average chance of falling pregnant that is across the board at clinics. If we can manage your stress better, we can double your chances of the next IVF being successful. So it's not blaming, it's actually empowering people to actually, first of all, manage that next IVF better and manage something that's completely out of their control better. In the moment, at, at a clinic here in Johannesburg, Medfem Fertility Clinic, we are busy looking at correlating salivary amylase that was done at Ishri with the, the um, kind of initial, initial pretest of people going through IVF. And we are noticing that the higher their stress scores on a particular stress test that I'm going to give you access to, the higher their salivary amylase. And we're waiting for next year um, to go and enroll a whole lot of clinics. We're busy updating the course so that we can have people across the world testing the salivary amylase at clinics and then going through a course and then correlating that to pregnancy outcome. Now, just in terms of um, access to testing your, your stress levels, if you go to the website um, www.taps.co, there is a test there where you're more than welcome. It's for free. You can test your stress in terms of that and have a look at what the outcome. It'll give you immediate feedback and say, this is where you fit in terms of your stress management. And then there is obviously the option of doing a stress management program. They also run on Zoom. Um, and if you look for the trigger or for the hashtags unhooked or hook time or taps, there are numerous videos posted on social media in terms of getting you through this. So it is not something you need to go and see a therapist for. It is something you can you can do yourself. And that's my talk for this evening. Um, I'm more than happy now to ask questions, answer questions, that is. And thank you, Mandy, so much for all the tips you have just provided, uh, but also for those uh, real life um, experiences that you have mentioned. Of course, those are definitely, I mean, everyone can relate to that. So huge thanks for that. It's been really uh, good to have you back. And thank you so much for providing this topic to us. It's very important. Absolute pleasure, Caroline. Thank you so much. And yes. Pleasure definitely time to start our q a session so of course as always remember you can type it in right here in the chat section so that many can help you out with your questions but of course if you would like to share any comments anything that's on your mind right now go ahead and do it uh, one someone some people are typing right now of course some 
And there is one question ready right here. So let's get to it. I'm second round now, IVF transfer. I'm a stressed person. My transfer is in a week. Is it too late to start managing stress? Not at all. So Shirley, um, the point being, look, we look at a kind of 10 session program, but what was very interesting is by the time people got to session four, in fact, the pregnancy rate was shooting up by session four. And I can promise you just by measuring your stress and starting to manage it, just by what I've said to you before, session two, which I've, I've already kind of done with you, I always say to people for one week, just have a look at two triggers a day and two reactions. Write this down so you've got a spread of 10. You can do that in one day if you want. And then have a look at what is real and what is self-induced. You will notice that's a pretty hard question. So the real stuff is the stuff I don't care if you worry about. And, and it, it is the stuff that a relaxed person would worry about. So that's question number one. And I say to you, if it's real, worry more. But you've got to be honest with yourself. Because we're trying to create a thinking pattern that says, you know what, when this is not real, it's no use me saying to you, stop stressing about the stuff that's not real. So what I'm saying to you, when it's real, stress more. Second thing I'm saying to you, when any trigger over the next week is unpredictable, you just got to try and say, could I have made it predictable? You don't need to change anything else. And that already will give you, um, that will reduce your stress already in one week. And then beyond that, managing your stress will actually help you in terms of dealing with your result going forward. So no, it's definitely not too late. Exactly. Thank you so much for your very first question. And Mandy, thank you for that. Encouraging words, though, definitely. So uh, remember, it's never, never too late. Thank you so much for this. All right. And there are more and more questions coming up right now as we speak. So let's get to, uh, uh, to the next one. And there is actually also a comment from Shirley. This was super insightful. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And next question. Yes, thank you for your talk. Could you please explain a bit more about endometriosis and personality type and how it relates to stress fertility? Okay, so our original study in 1996, and we wrote a book, um, which if you go onto taps.co, it is available there. Um, so what we had a look at is people with endometriosis, it often... And, and I mean, in South Africa, we're pretty different because in South Africa, we, we, we do laparoscopies if we're worried about endometriosis. But um, I know some countries don't, and they don't think that endometriosis has a big impact. But we were worried about putting patients through repetitive laparoscopies um, because of scar tissue and obviously because of what it did to the womb. So we said, how do we... So we decided to grab patients with this personality type and with endometriosis and without endometriosis. 100%, and I'm not lying to you, 100% of our patients who have one symptom of endometriosis, and that might simply be diarrhea with their cycle, or it might be infertility, and if they're time urgent and perfectionistic. We've got, so the test that I've exposed you to, all of them on laparoscopy had endometriosis. Now, the way it relates to stress is endometriosis, you must imagine, is abnormal growth of tissue on the uterus. So the body's immune system is supposed to, every time you have a period, it must shed its lining properly and then your womb starts afresh. But if your immune system is not functioning properly, what happens is it's... Um, the immune system doesn't get rid of all that blood that's going down. So it starts forming this kind of plastic film around. And um, like I say, it is an immune problem. It is um, also indirectly, we know that stress is related to insulinemia because the hyperinsulinemia, because people eat differently. Um, it's related to thyroid problems and all of our patients Across the board, the patients I see, endometriosis, polycystic ovaries, thyroid disease, and they all have the same personality type. 
And wonderful. Thank you so much again for your explanation to this question. And let's have a look at the next one. More pro questions coming up right here. Can we really say that if you manage your stress, you will be increasing your chance of success? I am talking as a counselor. Absolutely. Francine, I can see where you come from because the research over the years has been very sketchy in terms of stress and IVF and the impact of it. But Eshri, last year, specifically when we could travel, and, um, you know, we started our research 24 years ago. You wrote our first book. And we have seen clinically how our, our, our patients have benefited from managing their stress, but not only in terms of success, but in terms of their marriages, in terms of coping with a potential negative result, in terms of taking the next step going forward. And yes, I mean, I can definitely say it increases your chance. I am, because I had cancer, I had to stop my PhD, but my PhD is definitely on publishing, because as we know, you've got to publish in order to get something recognized around the world. And I can promise you, in a year or two, I'll be doing a keynote talk on how stress and the decrease of stress um, increases fertility success. That is our aim, because I, I, I've seen it for 25 years in myself, in my patients. And excellent. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that as well. It's definitely encouraging to, to know that. And um, actually, there are more questions in regards to just what you said. So let me go to that question and we will go back to the next, uh, to the previous one, I mean. Um, so my doctor who does acupuncture says that stress have no impact because during the, I'm not sure, sorry here, there are many the people... War. War, I guess, yes. There are many people that get pregnant and they don't want to, but they didn't reduce stress and they got babies. So, Martina, I want to ask, so I assume that's war. And again, if we look at real stress, look at women who are raped, look at in South Africa, especially, and I'm sure it's around the world, we have a high teenage pregnancy rate. These girls don't want to be pregnant. They definitely stress because um, they're in poverty and they've been raped, etc. but they fall pregnant. Remember, I'm defining stress in terms of what is real and what is not. People in war are definitely stressed, but it's real stress. If you put a relaxed person in that situation of a war or COVID-19 or a rape, they will fall pregnant because in real stress, we're secreting adrenaline. In stuff that is self-induced, the chronic, silly stuff that a relaxed person says, but I'm not stressed about that. That is where people are not falling pregnant. And that is the stress we can manage. So so definitely, if, if that's war, people in war, poverty, floods, um, trauma, their pregnancy rates are extremely high because they're not focused, they, they're focusing on real stress. And that's adrenaline, and that does not impact on the outcome. All right. Thank you so much, Mandy, once again for your help with this. Okay. And more questions are definitely coming up. So let me go to the next one. I am scheduled for my first IVF in a month. I'm trying not to stress any tips. Okay. So I think first thing is familiarize yourself with the process. So I almost want you to change your thinking and say, my first IVF is a very expensive, invasive, investigative procedure. So my first IVF, I produced 24 eggs back in the day, but they were all useless and I was overstimulated and it didn't work. And I thought that was the end of my world and I couldn't afford a second one going forward until much later. Um, and I knew I had to familiarize myself with the process and I had to look at almost what is my next step. And it's not saying what is the worst case scenario, but what if this IVF doesn't work, Jessica? What would be your next step? I wrote a chapter last week, uh, last year for um, 
a medical textbook where they tried to say, why do parents who adopt fall pregnant and why do parents who kind of give up or fall pregnant? Now, none of us, and I, I've been a fertility patient for many years, none of us want to hear, relax and it'll happen. That's rubbish and peace of mind and it'll happen. But as soon as you focused on what is the next step going forward if this one doesn't work, I promise you, you'll cope better. And if you familiarize yourself with the process and you break your IVF into manageable parts and say, stims and then it's first scan. Okay, got through that part. Then it's a few more stims and it's next scan. Got through that part. So you break it up into little batches to cope. And excellent. Once again, thank you so much. So step by step is to focus on, right? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Okay, and more of those are coming up. So let me just not waste time and go ahead with the next one. So how to manage the environment around you during the procedure? People are always giving different opinions and it's really difficult to make others understand what you are factually feeling. Because with all the medicine and anxiety, sometimes you really are not able to express yourself. Okay, so when I see people i often say it is not we can't change other people we can't necessarily change our environment like i can't change the fact that COVID had an impact on our business or that COVID had an impact on my family but i can change the way i react to it and the way i think about it and sometimes with people giving different opinions and i assume that's about maybe your infertility and not understanding what you're feeling sometimes you've got to have some standard response that you give them um where you got to choose with discretion who you're going to talk to and how much you want to express and and you know what there are a lot of support groups and i know maybe that's not what you want but you've got to understand people who haven't been through this are going to give you the wrong answer, not because they, you know, they, their intentions are bad, but purely because they haven't been through it themselves. And it's like when someone passes away, they don't know what to say. So they avoid it and say the wrong things. So I think it's best to try and change the way you think about the environment as opposed to the environment, which we often can't change. All right. Again, thank you so much. And actually, while we are on that topic, okay, maybe you can add something. How to deal with family who don't want to tell because you know they will cause more stress than support. Bar hand tied to tell. Okay. So, with family, um, so you've got to decide, is it more important to have their support or not? So, I have patients who either, I was totally open with my family, but my family is Catholic and very conservative. So I didn't want to give my family too much detail. They also um, didn't know kind of what is aspiration. And I didn't want to go into all that detail. So I would kind of just say, I'm going for an IVF and would give them a white lie about when my pregnancy result was so that I could first deal with it, even if it's a day later. I mean, you've got to think, do you want to tell them if you're feeling you have to? And if your partner maybe is feeling you have to or work feels you have to, a lot of my patients are forming an admin only WhatsApp group, if, if that's what you want, where you say on the group, um, or I'm not sure which part of the world you are, maybe you don't have WhatsApp, but you're able to then just put a notification on that, you know, you might not be ready to talk, but here's a bit of feedback and here's a bit of feedback. And um, so, you know, I think with discretion, you've got to choose who you're going to tell and who you're not and what is the benefit at the end of the day. If you're worried about disappointing them, that's a self-induced stress. Going back to what I'm saying, that is not, if they're going to criticize you, if they're going to say the wrong thing, if they're going to get so upset for you, remember how I broke the stress up, that's a self-induced stress. Relaxed person's not going to stress about that. And that's something I want you to put into that category and say, either I'm going to manage it differently in terms of those four cycles, or I'm going to avoid it and not tell them. 
Once again, thank you so much for those uh, tips, of course, as well on that. And uh, there is not really a question, but perhaps you can add something. So I think it is very difficult to reduce stress of you if you had bad uh, experience, lost two babies and do not get pregnant anymore. I'll go to Pilates. Anything you can add? You know what? I know. Um, and I'm sorry you've lost two babies. It's, it's extremely difficult and it's, it's definitely very real and it's definitely something that um, you know, there's now I don't know if you had primary infertility before, but there's now the secondary infertility, and I don't know if your chances are completely negative right now. I That's a very real stress, but then it means, remember what I said about something that's real, is maybe you need to then examine whether you can take this any further, whether you need to go and speak to someone. And again, in terms of something like Pilates, absolutely go for it even if it, if it makes you feel better. But if it's a stress to go to Pilates and take time out and you feel it's not helping you, then it's actually more of a negative than a positive. But I'm so sorry you've lost two babies. And I, I do think um, maybe you need to, if you haven't already, go for support in terms of grief counseling because you carry with you into the future this complete lack of enjoyment of potentially another pregnancy and this complete fear and this complete anxiety going forward. And thank you so much. And well, we definitely are keeping our fingers crossed that it's all going to be okay in the end. Okay. All right. And let's have a look, of course, there are more questions coming up. So how much should the partner be involved when dealing with stress during IVF? I mean, women is kind of more into the treatment from medical points. How to talk about it with him? So, yes, Mel, you're right. I mean, husbands are often, my husband won't, he would never go to a therapist. Um, so, I often have to do a white lie um, to get them in to come and talk to me. And I, I would love it if clinics in South Africa or wherever around the world would actually say every couple going through IVF or presenting to a fertility clinic gets given a counseling session. Just, you know, the husband doesn't need to know this is a counseling session on what to expect when you're trying to conceive. But be given that and be told this is the process that your wife is going to go through. This is what it's going to do to your relationship. Um, you know, we do know the research says that husbands that are more involved in decision making and more involved during the IVF, um, those women have a better outcome in terms of, of, of pregnancy rates, but in terms of endometriosis healing as well. So um, to talk to him about it, I would often, if you get to talk to someone else or to show him I've got on my website lots of podcasts or 50-second videos I, I post every day on relationships, infertility, IVF, and I often get my wives to just share it with their husband and say, look what this man went through with his wife. Um, so, yes, I, I think it is important to acknowledge with him that he's not intricately involved and... Um, you know, is there any way you can get him more involved in it? You would like him to be with you at scans, even though with COVID, I know this is a little bit hard. But when couples come and see me, I actually have a card game that I play with them where I give the husband cards and I give the wife cards and I, they've both got the same emotions and I get, and you can make them yourselves. And I, I, I get the husband to put his pile of how he feels in terms of the fertility on one side and the wife in terms of the other, and then to share them and see what they've got in common. And it's often very, very similar. But the husbands will often say to me, they miss their wives in terms of this process. Their big loss is, yes, the negative result, but it's more what it does to their partner. Whereas the women and the men are often, it'll happen, it'll happen, we'll do it again, like, please don't get too upset. And they start coping independently and that's what we don't want. 
we actually want the wives to be able to fall apart in front of their husbands and their husbands to know that that's okay. So I think just to tell them maybe what is going to happen and that if you do fall apart and you do break down, it's not that you've changed and it's not the end of the world, you're going to be okay. You just need him there in terms of support. And wonderful. Thank you so much, Mandy, for saying that. And I totally agree. Uh, the counseling part should be definitely mm. included in all the IVF treatment options. So, um, yeah. yeah, definitely. This is something that, uh, well, we, we can only spread the word, but it's definitely something that should be more out there. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. Um, okay. And next one. Let's take a look. It's right here. I have had four times IVF and stress levels and fear are very high. What is the best I can do that will work? Okay. So I would suggest, firstly, is having a look at the stress sites and seeing how high your self-induced stress is. And then also to say for IVFs is a lot. Okay. So maybe to get an understanding as to why they didn't work and, and kind of... Um, is it due to low AMH levels? Is it due to something that they can possibly change? Is it due to, you know, you know I, I don't know if there needs to be a different process in terms of going forward. But um, I know with, when, when I was battling, I, to create that peace of mind is I would take a goal list and, and I get my patients to do it and I say, okay, write down what are your short, medium, and long-term goals, and write down what are your what is your fertility plan. So I don't say focus on the next IVF. I say, okay, if we do a fifth IVF and that doesn't work, Mandy, what is your, or, you know, what is your next step? Okay, well, then I might have to consider turning eggs, or I might have to consider um, donor sperm, whatever it might be. So we kind of have this roadmap in our minds of a fertility plan. We have our other goals that we still follow so our life is not whole, on hold and we merge them together to get some peace of mind. But I would strongly suggest if your stress levels are above 100 on that stress test that, that is online, um, then I think you need to then manage your chronic stress if it's high as a starting point. Yeah, exactly. So thank you so much once again for your question. And again, and Mandy, for your help. And uh, let's have a look, okay? Let's have a look at the next one. So after my last transfer, my mobile died. So I went to mobile shop and lost all my four years of messages. I felt very stressed with this having contributed to the failure. So Alison, it's, it's, that's quite a... Um... It's a very interesting question because when we look at stress and like chronic stress with, you know, and, and like a failed idea, a failed transfer, let's say, would be deemed maybe an early miscarriage or a, because in effect we've put an embryo in you. If we look at all that research, um, chronic stress is more involved in pregnancy loss towards um, the end of the pregnancy. So not as much acutely during that very moment. Also, stress is more involved in, in the chronic stress leading up to the development of the eggs. So no, I don't think, if you said to me that you are still worrying about, you know, that it's like three weeks down the line and you're still worried about the messages and you're still angry that... Um, you whatever you, you you lost your phone and you're still thinking oh, i wish i had those photos on my phone and i wish i had that that becomes a chronic stress for the next ivf but not for that particular ivf and thank you so in much. my opinion okay. and from what i've read of course thank you so much once again for your uh, clarification to that question as well all right, and again, we have another question from Francine. So let's have a look, okay? Is there 
already evidence-based about managing stress and IVF increased chance of success. I would like to be able to prove what I'm saying to my clients. Thank you very much for your talk. It is a very hot subject in the world of infertility. So Francine, absolutely. There's, you know what? It's, it's so sketchy, which is why I am dying to finish this, uh, the, my PhD. Um, if you look at the work of, now why does it, it um, she did a webinar recently, she's the guru with IVF. Anyway, it's on my social media platforms, but in terms of this talk, I, I did put down some of the research that emerged out of ESHRI. I looked at the research with this recent virtual ESHRI and I didn't find as much. So. You know, if you go onto any of my social media platforms, I have posted, I just, I post a um, kind of a, whenever I find research, a 50 second video clip that I make with my voice and with the research quoted. And there is the intermittent research that has been published. There is a lot that is busy, they're busy doing pilot studies on, but we're waiting for the, you know, you got to publish we've like i say there's books written there's anecdotal stuff there's subjective and qualitative studies but 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 science is looking for statistics and they're looking for numerous variables but if you look at salivary amylase and stress and if you look at doma at at, at um, dr doma's um work on stress and infertility um you you can then find evidence for that. And again, excellent. Thank you so much for your question and Mandy again for your information on that. And actually, of course, as you know, you can check this out on Mandy's social medias and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting and useful for you as well. All right, and there are like a few questions left. We will be slowly finishing. So if you have any questions left, just go ahead and type those in the ch in the chat section right now. And let's have a look at the next question. So my husband is a doctor, super stressful job. He can be stressed, but not like me. How can I manage the stress? Okay, so Shelly, I'm asking if, so are you telling me your your husband who's the doctor is super stressed um or you more stressed than him so if you're telling me that you're a relaxed person and he's super stressed i would say well you know what um that's not your problem and that is self-induced if you're taking that on okay you're more stressed than him all right so my husband is also, my husband, in fact, is a fertility stress, a, a fertility specialist in South Africa. 20 people come into his rooms at nine in the, it's from six in the morning. They queue from about five and it's back on back scans. Um, and then it's aspirations transfers and then it's, it's theater. And it's a super stressful job, but you know what? He enters into it and he probably like your husband, he knows when to apply his stress and he deals with it and gets off it. He deals with the next patient, gets off it, deals with it, and he gets home and it's done, okay? You're probably someone who chronically stresses. And the interesting thing is a lot of women will say to me, I'm going to give up my job. It's all my job that's creating stress. And it's not. The most stressful people I see are the ones who've taken, who've been boarded or maybe have taken off a three-month sabbatical or are home executives, so to speak. So if you look at the old research about men who have heart attacks, they don't have heart attacks in the boardroom. They have heart attacks when they are on Mauritius, when they have retired, when they're traveling down to the coast. So as soon as you, it's almost like the body's able to say, okay, there's your husband, super stressed doctor. He needs to secrete adrenaline in this moment, but he gets off it. And then here am I as a wife thinking, what am I going to cook for dinner? Um, or the house is a mess, or look at these deadlines I haven't finished, or look at everything I have to attend to admin-wise. And the mind is able to say, but hang on a second, that is not real stuff. That is not a doctor going into an anesthetic where he needs adrenaline. And that's where the impact on the immune system is, is that you need so to manage your stress. You need to identify 
what is real and what is not. And I can bet you he's probably a well, what we call a well-functioning type A personality, which I'd like to say that's what my husband is. Um, and I'd like to think I'm that most of the time. All right. Thank you so much again, Mandy, for explaining that to us. Uh, I believe that was very, very helpful. Thank you so much for this. Um, all right. And there are like a few questions left. And uh, let's have a look at the next one, actually. Also, not sure <laughs> to recommend book, but there is a great book called Get Alive, His and Her Guide to IVF. Great books. This is, of course, something you might be familiar with, but... Not sure. I'm not. And I would I would love to have a look at that. Get alive, he's in her going to IVF. That that I, I I'm well thank you for that. Yeah, um, definitely. Sounds interesting indeed. It does. Exactly. It does. So thanks. Thanks for that. This is something that we might thank actually you. check it. Um, okay, and there's another question from Charlie. Um, I haven't shared with my close friends about my idea because I don't want to hear from those that haven't had a hard time. Is this causing unwanted stress as well? What are your thoughts? So, Shelley, I think you've got to say um, sometimes we got to weigh stress and we got to say, okay, um, so I can tell them and it creates a bit of stress for me because they're going to say the wrong things and they don't know what I'm going through and they're going to be dismissive and they're going to be falling pregnant and all of that. Or we might say not telling them um, is avoiding the trigger. But if the not telling them is actually stressing you more than what it would telling them, then you need to tell them. So you've got to kind of say, what is the benefit? And I mean, the end of the day, I think it is stressing you. So, so I would then say, okay, let's have a look in terms of that stress cycle. It's not real because relaxed people, believe me, they will tell the whole world or they will choose certain people and not care what other friends say. But it sounds to me like it's a perfectionism thing. And then in terms of how we manage our stress, we look at that stress cycle and we say, okay, when I'm about to tell them, let me get my physical self under control and let me get my breathing under control, we've got an exercise that we implement there. Then our self-talk is, you know what? They're going to say the wrong thing. They don't know what this is about. They've just got married. They're probably gonna send me a, a message that they're pregnant soon. There's a certain way we challenge your thinking and then there's a certain way we say to you, okay, this is how you maybe behave and this is how you articulate yourself or be assertive when you are telling them if you've decided to address this. So absolutely, I think if it's worrying you, then it's something you need to look at in terms of that stress cycle I've explained where you implement one of those four solutions to actually addressing the problem. And thank you once again for your question here and your help with that. Okay, and let's have a look. We have a bit of a different question. So how do we do we go about enrolling for your saliv salivary MLI study? What all is involved in the process? Okay, Jim, so I've been a bit slack on this because of COVID, I have been inundated with Zoom calls and, and meetings all over. So our, our stress site is running. Of course, the university wants a more, um, how can I say, the stress site's been running for about 15 years. Um, we need a, we're busy updating the entire stress cycle to make it have videos and interactive um, virtual sessions, etc. Right now, it's very much you go online and you can manage your stress or um, people Zoom me and they manage their stress. Once the salivary MLA study, especially next year when I, I find out exactly what the university wants, I'm going to then allow, you know, I sit on the board in South Africa and on various other boards, we're going to try and get a lot of clinics involved. And it would purely just be taking possibly a level of your, uh, you know, the salivary MLAs, if they decide that's a parameter they want, all they might do is like say, we just want to know what is the person's sperm count? What is their egg quality? What's their previous IVF result like? This is their stress score. Then 
you do a free 10 week or 10 session stress management course. And then we say, now this is what the sperm looks like. This is what the IVF result looks like. And, and so it's going to be very simple in terms of comparing. And all that will be involved from the individual is basically, we will use the bloods from the clinics or the, whatever results they've got. You would allow them to share that data anonymously. Or we, you know, we, we would keep that private. And then you would just enroll yourself on the course. So we would definitely let people know. And I would let... My VF, my IVF answers no, obviously, when, when that study comes around. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing this. This is definitely interesting. And I'm already waiting for that, Mandy. Thank you so much for that question Thank indeed. You. And this is something that uh, it's good to know for sure. Thank you so much. All right. And let's have a look. Okay. There's another question right here as well. So starting with IUI and IVF, I had to, to take many hormones and also my thyroid got working slower, which is not good for having the embryo to stick. Could it be stress being the, could the stress influence it? So absolutely. I mean, underactive thyroid is definitely one of the autoimmune things that we look at. I mean, first port of call is I would get your fertility specialist or your, um, you know, whatever doctor you're seeing to have a look at um, putting you on, you know, here we use altruxin or euthyrox. So you would need medical treatment probably for that thyroid. I don't know if there's thyroid antibodies, which you might need um injections for or what we call there's certain drips there's different protocols around the world but definitely stress can have an influence on that as well um so we would first put a call is put the patients on the meds measure their stress and okay so i'm not sure what that is so it's probably a generic uh, so you do take something all right so so that would be first port of call. I mean, it, you would also have a look at if you've also got a history of endometriosis, if you've got a history of um, polycystic ovaries, autoimmune problems, spastic colon, like a, a whole range. You'll see on the website there's a whole range of symptoms. Um, it all indicates that, yes, then there's often like a, a symptom subset related to this personality type. That if we manage the stress, it has an impact on all of those in terms of immune system, chronic depression, um, insomnia, spastic colon, the old yuppie flu, the um, Crohn's disease, all of those kind of illnesses. And thank you so much for that as well, of course. All right, there are like two questions left. And the next question is something that I definitely hear quite a lot. So... Let's have a look, okay? For me, it is very stressful that you cannot change your mind because you wake up in the morning and think about about it and you uh, cannot stop to think about a baby the whole day. How can you reduce the stress level? I really want to think on the topics, but it does not work. I know, Martina, and I know it becomes, and I'll be honest with you, and it's not... I'm not running down anyone who's had cancer, but I I had stage two cancer, so I needed um, a double mastectomy and I needed chemo and radiation and all, all of that kind of stuff. And, and um, it was a long-term protocol, but I coped far better with my cancer than I ever did with my infertility because my oncologist said, this is what you do. This is, I had no choice. And the thing that, and, and she said, okay, if you do X, Y, Z, there's a 95% chance you're going to live. That's great. Well, you know, um, like that's a high statistic. We don't get that in infertility. So, and a lot with infertility is to do with science doesn't understand it. Science understands cancer uh, to a large degree. It doesn't understand all the stuff with stress and with um you know, if you believe in God, I don't know, some people say that the surgeons have the hands, but they don't have the ability to then create a life if it's not meant to be. So it is very hard thinking about a baby or day. I'd, I'd like to know if you're working or if there's anything else that distracts you, because a lot of the time, um, 
people do tend to, especially if they're not working, that becomes all they think about all day, every day. Um, so I'm not sure if you are working because sometimes there needs to be some sort of distraction. I do an exercise with patients where I have a look at everything going on in their life and I have a look at, you know, general things that they do. So if they are working, so you are working. If they are working, what is the value attached to working? What is the value attached to their relationship at the top? What is the value attached to having a baby? And then we look at all the values attached to having a baby, which is a sense of belonging and fulfillment and nurturing, etc. And then I say, all right, what else can we do to fulfill that value in the interim? So, so for me, a lot of it was about nurturing um, my value about having a baby. So I would, I, that's how I started working with children in a, a sex abuse clinic, which um, became difficult once I did fall pregnant, but that's where my work started. Or um, we have, I was saying to Caroline, we have a million rescue dogs. I, that would fulfill my sense of, of, of nurturing in some way. My sense of not belonging, it would be that I found um, a different group of people that, you know, because when you're battling to have a baby, there's those that are going out all the time and there's those that are not um you know that are, are, are married and settled and have kids and you kind of don't fit in anywhere and i see you say you've got a busy job but i think if you can start breaking up because it's become automatic for you to just think about the baby all the time so i think if you can break up for a week for me what are the triggers about the baby what are other triggers potentially and your typical reaction and then start determining what is predictable and what is not. Because what it does is we're getting the brain almost to, instead of automatically just thinking, waking up and thinking about a baby, we're getting it to first think, is this real or not? And then you might still stress about the baby, but eventually the next week, is this predictable? Okay, it's predictable. Maybe I must avoid it. How can I avoid it in terms of the cycle? So all we're doing is we're getting your stress not to be automatic anymore, like a Pavlovian response. We're stopping you and saying, first think about if the stress is, is beneficial or not or predictable or not. So, so I, I would strongly suggest you have a look at that. And if you don't want to register for a course, measure your stress levels, go on my social media, and all the advice is there for free. It's there. Yeah. And wonderful. Once again, thank you so much for that advice as well. And it looks like this will be our final question, a little bit of topic, but I'm sure you'll be able to help. So I'm worried about choosing a donor. I have been offered two, one with a very good resemblance and one without such a resemblance, but with proven fertility. How important is proven fertility? I could also have a mixture from both donors Confused. okay so proven fertility is either going to be proven fertility in terms of an IV, a previous donation or we determine it in terms of she's got children herself so i don't know what what, what you mean by proven fertility at this point what what i tend to see with the couples i help choosing a donor is initially they want one who looks like them one whose profile they like one who is very similar to them and same height, et cetera, et cetera. And then if that one doesn't work, then suddenly, so previous donation, all right. Then suddenly they're saying, you know what, Mandy, just give me a donor that's a proven, proven donor because right now I cannot take any more disappointments. Um, proven fertility, again, you look at myself and I actually um, – had 24 eggs initially, but then my second and third IVF, I had 14 follicles, one egg, 13 follicles, one egg. So, and I was young at the time. So it, proven fertility, yes, might, you know, in that particular cycle was good, but what about the next cycle? Um, we don't know that it's necessarily going to be the same. So I you know, and resemblance again, if you if, if your country allows for you to do a mixture of both, why not? Um, if, if that's important for you. I know in South Africa we're starting to limit the number of embryos placed back. So 
you've got to be more sure, but I maybe, uh, you know, you can decide which looks better at the end. Um, and maybe you do want to know what the, if the child looks like you in some way. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's a difficult. Remember that even with proven fertility, if you look at the whole field of epigenetics, the fact that you're carrying the child will also um, have an impact on how the child looks. And wonderful. Thank you so much again for explaining that. And of course, Alison, thank you for your question. I believe it has been helpful for you. And uh, well, we will be finishing for today. But thank you so much, Mandy, for a brilliant session. There are many, many comments right here. So um, I'm no doubt that it has been useful to everyone. And also, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for joining us tonight for your question. And of course, it's, it's good to have you here. And I'm glad uh, and I'm sure it has been very useful for you. And Mandy, of course, as always, I want to see, I want to, you to see, of course, sorry, um, oh, some comments. Thanks. What an informative session. Thank oh, you. Oh, hello, Carabo. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you for the talk. And super helpful. So thanks. only very good. Um, and also right here. Thank you so much. I learned so much tonight. Aww. Um, okay, there's one more from Francine. I have some more work to do and need to go, but thank you so much for the great talk and I will keep in touch. <laughs> You're working too hard, Francine. <laughs> and there's another one. Thank you so much for your insight. This gave me a boost of inspiration. Really great best practices. Thank you, Shirley. Thanks, Martina. And there are like uh, more and more of those coming up. So more thank yous. And well, I can oh, Brid say. Brigitte, thank you. That's <laughs> yes. Yes, I know, Brigitte. Thank you. That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that then. All right. So as you can see, more of those coming up. So um, Mandy, it's always good to have you here. So once again, thank you so much for supporting our Stronger Together initiative. And thank you so much for today's presentation and all that you have explained, because the, as I always say, these kind of topics, those are uh, something that we need to have more and more. We need to discuss them. Those are the, the things that we should not forget as well. Yeah. So thank you so much. And uh, Mandy, is there anything else you would like to add? No, I just like to say I, I honestly feel even if management of your stress doesn't result in a successful IVF, I can promise you it'll, ho it'll help you cope better with a potential negative by managing your stress. You can't lose. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There's nothing else to add to this, really. Um, so, so once again, I just want to mention that remember that it has been recorded. Tomorrow it will be available on our website, myivfences.com, and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. So just go ahead and subscribe. That way, when the video is uploaded, you will be notified. And of course, you can find all the rest of our events on uh, our Facebook, Instagram, but also, of course, on our site. And as you know, we will be back here tomorrow at 8 p.m. UK time. So I hope you can join us. There are more uh, topics coming up uh, tomorrow. We have another special guest. And of course, we will again, we will be back again on Monday and etc. So as always, it's really great to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining. Mandy, I know this is just another webinar and I know I will uh, be able to see you soon. So thank you. Thank you as well, <laughs> as always. It's great thank pleasure. You. Have a, everyone pleasure. have a relaxing uh, evening yes. and <laughs> yes. best of luck to all of you. We definitely want to hear some positive news from all of you soon as well. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Caroline, so and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.